So I think we are ready to get started with the presentation. Okay. So I just um, wanted to start off by thanking everybody for attending today. And so I'd like to start by providing some general background information on the climate of the Great Plains. Um, this is where the tribes involved in this project you're going to hear about today are located. Um, because the Great Plains are landlocked and they're located far away from oceans, this region experiences four very distinct seasons and has really large temperature swings. So for example, it can get really hot in the summer, but it can also get very cold in the winter. And uh, because this region is directly impacted by three distinctly different air mass types, um, the Great Plains experiences a wide variety of very interesting weather. And this kind of setup um, is very unique. There's actually very few places in the world uh, that are quite set up like this. Um, and, and there's also a good reason why the Great Plains are also known as Tornado Alley. That's because during the springtime, all of these air masses clash and produce severe weather outbreaks um, like tornadoes, large hail, damaging winds. Um, the region gets flooding. It's very common during the spring um, due to both snow melt and convective precipitation. Um, and the winters are also very harsh in the Great Plains. This region is accustomed to heavy snowfall, ice storms, extreme cold. Um, during the summer, the region can experience extreme heat, um, can experience drought, which is very damaging to crops, given that the Great Plains are part of the region known as the breadbasket of the world. So I think it's safe to say that uh, just about, almost just about every climate uh, type of uh, disaster that you could imagine, uh, the Great Plains has experienced a, a large portion of them. So as if all these extremes aren't difficult enough to deal with on occasion, um, sometimes we have one extreme event that comes on the heels of another. And this actually happened in 2011 and 2012. Um, in 2011, the upper Missouri River Basin received above normal snowpack during the winter. And then it warmed up very quickly in the spring and caused um, the snow to melt very quickly. And then on top of that, May was extremely wet in that region. And so all these combining factors produced a devastating flood that impacted many states and tribes in the Great Plains region. And then the very next year, as everyone was still reeling from the impacts of the flood, the faucet basically turned off um, and the region experienced an extensive and intense drought that cost over $30 billion in damage. And a lot of that um, was due to crop losses. And unfortunately, climate scientists have predicted these types of extremes are expected to become more frequent, more intense with climate change. Um, these extremes have, have very much impacted tribal communities in the Great Plains. Um, has their natural resource managers very concerned about how to handle these types of conditions in the future? And that's brought about a need for more planning. So I wanted to take a moment to talk about the High Plains Regional Climate Center's Tribal Engagement Program. And for over a decade, we've been working with tribes throughout the Missouri River Basin region and beyond um, to increase tribal resiliency to drought and other climate extremes. And so the primary activities we've worked on with tribes is providing workshops and hands-on training uh, sessions on how to locate and use climate data and information. Um, we've helped with uh, co-production of climate and drought summaries that can be used as a monitoring or decision-making tool. We've provided assistance with drought planning for specific reservations, um, and we've also uh, helped develop these climate and drought dashboards, which is the focus of our talk today. So the dashboard concept came about after hearing feedback from our tribal partners um, following these hands-on training sessions we've done that it would be really helpful if all the climate data and resources that we showed them during the training sessions could actually be in one place. And so the first dashboard we developed was for the tribes of Wind River in Wyoming. And the dashboard includes maps and graphics for monitoring temperature, precipitation, drought conditions, water supply conditions, and climate outlooks. And eventually we followed up with our partners at Wind River to see if they were using the dashboard and if so, how were they using it? And they said it has been very helpful. 
And the Tribal Water Engineer's Office actually gathers information from the dashboard and presents it at their water board meetings. Um, and they're also using the dashboard for decision making. Um, just a little background, the Wind River Reservation is in a semi-arid climate um, and they almost entirely depend upon mountain snowpack for their water supply. So they are very highly prone to drought, particularly uh, if the winter um, precipitation season, winter snowfall is not good. Um, and then in May every year, they have to decide whether to declare drought on the reservation. And so that would impact their irrigators and all the other uses of water that they have as part of their tribal water code. And so they make that decision based on the outcome of the mountain snowpack season. Um, they look at the timing of the runoff um, from that, and they look at current and forecasted climate conditions. And they've been able to use the dashboard to help gather that information. Um, so after showing other tribal partners this dashboard, there was a lot of interest from other tribes in having a dashboard. Um, so the next one that we created was for the Rosebud Sioux Tribe. Um, and then we began a project with the nine tribes in EPA Region 7, which are located in Kansas and Nebraska and Iowa. And they requested a dashboard as part of this project. So we changed the design and changed the layout. Uh, that way there was just one dashboard, but then several tribes could use it. So now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Mark, and he's going to talk more about the project uh, that we were part of and how it came about. So go ahead, Mark. Hey, thanks, Crystal, and thank you, uh, everyone, uh, for having me here. I really feel honored to be able to share some of the work that uh, we've been doing over about the, the past six years uh, dealing with climate and uh, the, the projects that we have envisioned uh, for the future and some of the, the products that have come about uh, in the course of that. Uh, we began this in about 2014, kind of exploring um, some of the, the impacts that, that may have been anticipated uh, due to some of the national climate assessments that had been released. And we, one thing we really realized is that the Midwest and our area was going to be impacted. Uh, we really had very little idea of how it was going to impact Indian country. And the other thing that we noticed is that the data uh, they were using wasn't always tribally focused. Uh, it deal, uh, the, the good numbers that they're using are, are dealing with population centers that uh, are distant from us. Uh, even with the uh, weather radar, when we're tracking a storm, we're in a location where uh, we're about equidistant between the, the two points in like Omaha, Nebraska and Topeka, Kansas. And, and so uh, we're getting very limited uh, radar images and so uh we've got we're at a natural disadvantage when it comes to that and so it seemed like pretty logical to take advantage of some grant grant opportunities that the bia had involving climate and also at that point in time um we all uh the, the tribes all have environmental programs in which the the epa had been stressing uh include and encouraging us to include a, a climate component or a climate change component and so it was pretty easy to uh, get everyone on board, uh, especially the, the four Kansas tribes were located within about 30 miles of each other. So it, it really is pretty easy for us to communicate and get together and, and share some of our ideas. And as we started uh, formulating this grant, uh, which came under a water management uh, BIA grant, uh, we started looking at the types of data that we would want and how we would share that data uh, so that we could all kind of be telling uh, stories with the same language and, and not, uh, you know, if one person's tracking, you know, high temperatures or temperature differentiations and the other person's tracking precipitation, what, what are our real interests? And we came up with about, oh, 15 or 16 different variables uh, that were kind of inter interested us. And we weren't really even anywhere close to knowing what climate was yet. None of us studies climate as a, you know, our full-time occupation or even weather for that matter. I get into a little bit of emergency management, but most of what I do deals with brownfields and hazardous materials and cleanup. So we we're all kind of jumping into a, a completely new arena. And so we had to begin by just kind of educating ourselves on what is the difference between uh, climate and weather and you know, I can't, uh, 
I think we have a real natural tendency uh, to think, you know, like every time that it snows, well, I mean, how many people do you know that will say things like, well, so much for global warming. And, and I love it. I think it was like Stephen Colbert said one time, well, I just ate lunch and cured world hunger. And I, I think we're, we're kind of fighting that battle uh, to, to, to make ourselves um, better understood about what we are trying to actually do. And so the, the climate data that we collect, we want to determine what um, kind of data it's going to be. Do we have specific tribal data that we want to include? Do we also want to take into account some of the, the data that our environmental departments are actually gathering, uh, along with some of the local data that we're getting from the airports or uh, the, the weather station there, and, and how often are we going to generate this data? Uh, is it going to vary from tribe to tribe? And who has control over it? Is there some sensitive data? And so it was a, a matter of being able to make ourselves aware of what uh, data we wanted. Um, are we going to use this for forecasting? Uh, can we use it for preparedness? Um, we also began looking at some of the, the FEMA opportunities involving mitigation. And I think kind of the, the capstone of it all, at least in our grant progression, is going to be developing a, a climate change adaptation plan, which will work into all our departments and not just environmental. And so the first event that we had was uh, kind of dealing with how we're going to use the data. And we held a, uh, uh, an ethics and environmental data workshop down at the Prairie Band Pottawatomie, which was uh, really well attended. And we had people from the state of Kansas. We had people from FEMA and EPA um, and mapping experts. And so we began to get a, a better idea of how we're going to handle the data and realize that you know, some sensitive data is just not even going to be collected. And we can go about our our tasks without doing that, um, but we just want to be able to compartmentalize it and not necessarily share it with everybody, but we, it may re be requ required that you ask for it and, and someone may ask you, what are you going to use this data for? And uh, our subsequent uh, plans are, are dealing with uh, creating climate summaries uh, and putting together this, uh, this adaptation plan. Go to the next slide, if you would, Crystal. Uh, this is the, the climate summary, and it relies on a component that we call the, the climate dashboard. We try to put these out about quarterly, and they rely on data that uh, we've all kind of agreed upon it is really important. Uh, we generally start out with just you know something to kind of catch the people's eye, and it started out with just the, the four Kansas tribes. We're trying to expand it to all nine tribes in Region 7. But for right now, with the uh, with uh, my bandwidth, I I'm really having trouble to expand it uh, much farther. But I, I do realize that other people, like in Iowa, will read this. And so I thought the derecho story was extremely important. And then we also talk about uh, some of the different data sets that we have on the back. We always look at the rivers and streams. And then this one introduced the climate dashboard, which just, which just came out in uh, November. And we really had some uh, positive feedback on it. Uh, we can use it now to put together this dashboard so everything is in one place. And we can begin looking at uh, temperature. We can look at precipitation. Uh, we can even look at things like winds, severe storms, flooding. Uh, and weather, weather reports, uh, as well as uh, some, some events coming up that are pertinent to uh, climate or just the tribes in general. You know, we can do put powwows and things like that on it. And it, it's also the, the dashboard's probably a uh, key function for us is we have put together a drought early warning system. And that's the, the next slide. And uh, this is a, a spreadsheet that was put together by the tribes and kind of uh, put into action by NIDIS, which is the National Integrated uh, Drought Information System out of Lincoln, Nebraska. And we've got about 25 different uh, data sets um, made out of about 17 different categories. And so we are all now speaking the same language. 
And uh, right now it's uh, Denise Jensen at Winnebago is, is doing one up there. And so that kind of represents the, the northern half of region seven. And then I'm working on the southern half and, and we're using it for things like planning sampling events. Uh, we can also do some really pretty interesting things with, with predicting, um, especially uh, it, it, it's really noticeable in, in the last week. Um, if you notice um, in, the, in the columns uh, under 218, you can, or 211, you can see that this is looking at a six to 10 day temperature outlook. And it's showing that there's basically an, an 80% chance that it's gonna be colder than normal. And as we've been doing these for about a year now, um, we've never seen numbers that high before. And so it really did kind of, I'm not gonna say it set off alarm bells because again, I've never seen a number this high. So I don't know if that's a, a, a good thing, a bad thing. Um, but what I have noticed is the, the weather information that we're getting pertaining to these outlooks is getting to be, uh, they're going out a limb more and, and putting up big numbers instead of uh, just saying, well, there's a 33% chance that it's going to be warmer, a 33% chance is going to be colder, and a 33% chance is going to be normal. And so we're, we're seeing numbers like this, and it really got us to thinking, can we stage uh, some things throughout the community to maybe help some people adapt if we do have some cold weather? And then the, the graphic that, that pops up next um, really shows just how accurate that was and just how uh, advantageous um, our, our, our information was. So we were able to distribute these heaters to our housing development and it kept their pipes from freezing. We had a couple that did freeze, but it also allowed them to thaw it out before any real damage was done because all along our area, which is sitting right on the kind of the confluence of Nebraska, uh, Kansas, Iowa and Missouri, that, that's where our reservation is located. Uh, we averaged 25 degrees below normal then. So in our actual, uh, our coldest temperature here was about negative 25 and that's without the wind chill. And so we really saw some, uh, some benefit from this and we've only had it for, for a couple months. So it's been awesome. We also think we can use it for uh, maybe instituting some rules regarding irrigation on the reservation, because that is one thing we do have control of, even on a checkerboard reservation, we do have water rights. And so during dry periods, which are anticipated, uh, we can see this uh, being used as uh, evidence for a, a defensible position for irrigation control uh, for the tribe. Crystal? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about the dashboard itself. Um, so instead of doing a demo, I have a series of screenshots to give you an idea of what the dashboard looks like. Um, however, you will see that the direct link to the dashboard is on the slide and it's on several of the upcoming slides. So please feel free to grab the link and peruse the dashboard on your own, um, either while I'm talking about it or later on at your leisure. Um, so this is the landing page of the dashboard and you'll see here in the upper left hand corner, this is where the tribal area is selected. So there's nine tribes in this EPA region, but we group them into three areas based on uh, the location of the reservations. And so there are the four reservations that are in Northeast Kansas, Southeast Nebraska area. And then there are four reservations in Northeast Nebraska, and then there's one reservation in Iowa. Um, so you can go to the landing page and choose which area that you want to view. So the default is the Northeast Kansas, Southeast Nebraska. And here you will see that you get climate information for Kansas. But if I select the Iowa tribal area, um, then you get information for Iowa and you get Nebraska information for Northeast Nebraska. So I will mention right up front that one of the challenges of this project on our end uh, was not being able to provide reservation specific climate products. Um, there just really aren't very many out there and we didn't create any new products for this dashboard. These products that you'll see on here are all being pulled from various places on the web. And you know, like I said, unfortunately, there's very few products that provide that specific information for reservations. And we would need some GIS-based products to be able to achieve that. 
Um, so the dashboard is divided into several sections and the first one is current conditions. So here you can get maps for several time scales uh, showing departure from normal temperature and percent of normal precipitation. And I also should mention that you can click on any of these projects products on the dashboard and it will take you directly to the site where the data came from. So if you want to um, dig more into the data on the specific site that is coming from, then you can easily do that. And you can also, with the current conditions, you can get the weekly U.S. drought monitor maps. Um, you can get soil moisture and vegetation products. And you know, these are all particularly helpful for monitoring for drought conditions. So the next section contains various water supply products. So um, you can look at current stream flow, look at runoff, um, snowpack conditions. Um, so given that most of the tribes uh, from this project are in the Missouri River Basin region, it's really important to monitor these conditions for possible flooding uh, or drought. Um, given that a lot of the water supply often comes from the upper Missouri Basin, so um, it is very important to, to understand what's going on in that region as to, you know, what kind of water uh, supply you may be getting later on in the spring and summer. And so in the next section, you can actually dig into the data itself. And so after doing our own station analysis at HPRCC and in consultation with the tribes on the project, we chose several stations in and around the reservations that seem to have the most reliable data and we're currently still reporting data. So each tribal area um, has its own group of stations to choose from. Um, some of the stations are, are long-term stations, um, some haven't been around as long. Um, but another challenge that, that we have faced is that, you know, reservations are generally lacking in good, reliable climate station data. And this seems to be an issue across the board, um, not just with the tribes from this project, but most of the tribes we've worked with over the years, it, it tends to be a recurring issue. <clears throat> and it's really hard to make decisions when you don't have enough data to go on. And it's hard to get funding for relief from say a drought or a flood or some other natural disaster if you don't have the data to back up the need. The next section contains various summaries and reports on climate conditions throughout the region. And these are great if you don't have time to look at or interpret the data yourself, or if you're just not really data savvy, um, because most of these summaries are written by climatologists um, that can, um, you know, give kind of give you an overview of those of those conditions. Um, but you will see that Mark's summaries that he was just talking about are archived here. And this is the only reservation level product that we have on the dashboard. Um, and it's, it's just great that he's putting these together and that we can include these um, for that region. And finally, we have a forecast and outlook section. And so there's a lot of things to monitor for here. Um, a lot of this, I think, is assessing risk. So risk of flooding, risk of drought, risk of wildfires, severe weather. Um, you know, I think the dashboard is a way of putting all the pieces of the puzzle together. So it's really important to look at all these indicators to really get the big picture of the recent climate conditions and how they might change in the next few weeks or months. Um, I did want to point out a couple other things. Um, we created this dashboard with input from our tribal partners all along the way. And that way we were making sure it was easy to use and contained all the information that they wanted. Um, we also didn't just um, create this and hand it over to our partners. Uh, we actually held a webinar back in November to explain every one of these products and how to use them. And we did record that and we placed a direct link to it on the dashboard. Um, as you'll see there to the right of the tribal area, there is the link to that webinar. Um, that way anyone who needs help using it or interpreting a product can view the webinar and then learn more about the dashboard. Okay, I'm going to turn it uh, back over to Mark so he can talk about the uses for the dashboard. Mark, are you there? Sorry about that. Uh, the dashboard has, has been in use for a relatively short period of time. And so uh, we, we think it's important that the, the dashboard is, is iterative as we discover new uses for it. 
we're also coming out of a period of time when it was kind of frowned upon to use the word climate change. And so we've got a, a whole new group of users that are, are going to be interested in, in seeing some of the information we have. And they may have questions if they're, they're not on the dashboard. Well, uh, if they're relevant, let, let's have them up there and let, let's make sure it's the best, most accurate data that we can find with, with the, the most resolution to it pertaining to uh, the tribes and the, and the reservations in the region and and how how is that need uh, going to be impacted by climate. Uh, we really want to be able to um, help each other out with this, you know, the, the concept of tribes helping tribes is really huge because we're all relatively small tribes. Uh, when it comes to getting grants and information, it's important uh, for us to kind of group together so that we do have uh, that kind of force multiplier effect of, of you know, partners and, and uh, reach and the ability to, um, you know, help more people than others. Uh, also looking at the data, we want to make sure that we're, uh, you know, what is the frequency? You know, how often do we need to analyze this data and look it over? Um, you know, can we do it quarterly? Do we need to do it weekly? I, I think um, in, in weather circles, quarterly things, make a, a lot of sense and though we also do attend a lot of monthly uh, kind of summary and outlook uh, type webinars that are hosted by NOAA each month and so th those are extremely helpful as well and the states kind of lead those because we just don't have the the capacity to to put out you know market forecasts and things like that but we can use it when we're uh, trying to determine, well, are we going to do anything with our rents this year uh, for our, our leaseholders of our, our farm ground? And then uh, we also need to decide how we're going to communicate this information to our, our tribal members, our tribal council, the decision makers that are um, influencing um, not just the, the tribe, but the state, the county, because we're a part of those as well. And when it comes to that, we probably have a little bit more uh, of a capacity than even the counties to deal with that because uh, they've got such a, a big area to cover and, and budgets that are as stretched as ours. And then, you know, do, do, do certain data sets have a lifetime? Um, are, are we realizing that, you know, we've got all this information out here. Is anybody using a particular data set? Which ones are the most important? As we get more and more data, I think it's more important that we identify the ones that are, are key. And so we're not constantly going over data that really is not uh, that relevant. And, and we do have some data sets like that on there that uh, through our inability to quite understand what, what they are or whether they're just not uh, effectual um, uh, for us. Uh, I, I want to mention there was uh, the uh, GRACE groundwater monitoring, which has extremely limited resolution, but it's got some interesting data uh, that looks at, uh, you know, underground water, which is something that, you know, you just can't get that information anywhere. So the whole lifetime of a data set is, is important too. And we really want to be able to adapt it to the projects that uh, particular tribes will have. Thanks, Mark. Mm -hmm. um, and we're hoping to expand this dashboard um, at the HPRCC eventually to include more reservations. Um, we hope we're to uh, start with the Missouri River Basin and the, the tribes that are located within that, um, but possibly beyond that. And we'd like to have a different landing page where it would be more like a there would be a clickable map so that someone can just click on a reservation or um, choose one from a drop down list and then that would just go to their version of the dashboard. And so, um, but to make this dashboard bigger and better, uh, we are seeking some funding to do this. And we've had these discussions with NIDIS, uh, it's been mentioned a couple times, the National Integrated Drought Information System. They're a federal drought program um, and they do have a tribal engagement program. And so they're very interested in, in seeing this expanded. So we're hoping to start the dashboard expansion project with them maybe next year. And with that, um, that concludes our presentation. And here's our contact information if you want to reach out to us. And so thank you so much for listening and attending today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um,
so I think we've got a good bit of time um, to have some questions from the audience and we'll do this, uh, you know, pretty free form. I think you can unmute yourself and speak up and maybe we can um, shift back over into uh, gallery mode so we can see each other once again. Uh, I'm gonna do that on my screen anyway. Um, you know, I think maybe one thought just to get us started and, and I hope others will put on their video cameras as they're able. Um, you spoke a little bit about the usefulness of and the lifetime of data. And I thought that was a really interesting idea. You know, how both where you get your data from, the history that that, that relates to and, and, you know, decisions that were made previously that now inform where we can get climate data, but then also how these data sets are changing um, over time and how we're shaping them, but also our understanding of what's useful. So I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about, you know, the the use of the data and, and um, how maybe that has changed over time and how you see that changing in the future. Well, I, I really can't speak to how it has changed over time just because it's so new. We're still in, in what I would consider a baseline mode. Uh, as far as that drought early warning system goes, we began collecting data on that in December of 2019. So we've just got our first full uh, season of data. And I, I actually, I just yesterday, I got the first kind of plots uh, against the standard precipitation index of uh, the numbers that we've been collecting throughout the year. And uh, um, I, I can't quite share it with you right now because I, I, I'm not sure where on my computer it is, but it tells a really cool story that uh, mirrors, you know, what we saw at, at the ground level in that we had maybe our wettest August ever. And we were also at the same time uh, dealing with drought. Uh, the rains hit so hard and so fast that, and just in, in enough quantity to keep us from falling into drought, but we were dry. We had one of our longest dry spells ever where it was uh, about 33 days between rain events. And so the, the crops were really stressed and it could have been a lot worse had it been a, a hotter summer. Um, so we've got some stories we can begin to tell but we don't have a whole lot of really good examples of how we put that data into practice yet, just because it, it is so new. I, can't, I don't feel confident quite yet running to tribal council. Um, I, I got a feeling they would think I was like chicken little saying the sky has fallen. And so I just need a little bit more data to kind of back me up. Uh, Crystal, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add or uh, I'll ask another question if not. Yeah. Um, interesting. I, we've gotten a few questions in the Jamboard. Um, I think that that link is still available in the chat. It should be just above the bottom. Um, and one of them is um, if you don't have station data, is there radar data coverage that could be useful. And I guess I'll, I'll expand that. You know, are there other kinds um, of data sources that you can use to fill in gaps? And maybe also tell us where there are gaps. Hey, Crystal, I'll, I'll kind of defer that to you because she's the one that always tells me you can't get that or this is why it's not that good or this is something that's better, so. Yeah. Um... I guess I would first say that there really is no substitute for in situ data. Um, so on the ground observations is absolutely the best kind of information that you can get. Um, if you can't get that, um, there are radar data, there's estimates, um, you know, you can look at like a storm total precipitation and that type of thing. Um, there's also satellite data, you know, that that helps us, you know, try to understand, you know, where what might be going on there. Um, and we can also interpolate between stations. Um, you know, you probably see a lot of maps that I mean, that's what they do. Um, the ones that I showed on the dashboard, like the 
departure from normal temperature, precipitation, percent of normal, those are all interpolated. So, um, you know, I, what I could do instead of showing you that is you could look at a dot map and the dot map would be the actual individual station locations and what they're saying. Whereas then you have that interpolation um, and we have lots of interpolation techniques that are employed, um, you know, for different uses. Um, so there are, there are things that you can do, but, but really when it comes down to it, if you don't have reliable station data nearby, um, it's really tough. And, and precipitation is probably the hardest just because, you know, it can rain down the street and not rain at your house. Um, and it, and it can be very highly variable. Temperature is not so variable. So that's a little easier to use nearby data. But um, if you don't have that, that actual ground truth data, um, you know, nearby, especially for precipitation, it is really, really tough. Yeah, thanks. Um, another question that just popped up about um, uh, sort of a network of others who are doing similar work, um, specifically, you know, when you started this project and and over the last year, a couple of years as you've moved through it, have you come across other tribes or other regions, uh, climate um, centers that are doing similar work? And I think the the question came from someone who's specifically interested in the Pacific Northwest and Alaska, but also more generally. Yeah, um, you know, so we're part of the Regional Climate Center program. Um, I don't think there's as much going on with tribal engagement at the other centers. Um, however, the if you're familiar with the Climate Science Centers, which are part of the Department of Interior and um, they're associated with the US Geological Survey, um, they are doing some pretty extensive um, type of research on climate and work with tribes pretty extensively. Um, I know the one that covers most of our region is the North Central Climate Science Center, and that's uh, out of Colorado State University. And they actually have a tribal liaison, um, and there's quite a bit going on. And one of the PIs on that project is the Great Plains Tribal Water Alliance. Um, so they're very heavily involved. Um, I think there's a lot going on in the Southwest as well. Um, there's also NOAA RESA programs, so the Regional Integrated Science and Assessments. Um, and they tend to do a lot of applied work, um, a lot of research and such. Um, so I know there's been some, some work going on with um, like the Southern Climate Impacts Planning Program and they work with the South Central Climate Science Center. And so they're at the University of Oklahoma. So they're doing some tribal work. Um, the Southwest, I think there are some people in the Southwest. Um, I know the Pacific Northwest and Alaska regions, I know that there are, um, I would have to look and see if the climate science centers in particular may be doing some work, but I think they also have some RESAs. Um, if that's something you're interested in, if you, you know, jotted down my email, um, feel free to send me an email and I can actually, you know, do a little bit of digging for you and see if I can find some other groups that are, that are working on these kinds of issues in that area. Yeah, if whoever posed that question um, wants to either privately or publicly drop their email in the chat, I can make sure that you're connected. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, and yeah, another interesting another thing question. that I've noticed okay. is it's really variable by media. Um, the one thing I've noticed is like places that you wouldn't necessarily uh, expect to find people, all of a sudden you're, you're finding them now. Um, I know like uh, up in the Pacific Northwest, well, Lake Coeur d'Alene, they're beginning to incorporate some climate change stuff into their uh, lake monitoring strategy. And, and so it, it's becoming, you know, more, more of a, a I guess a, a used kind of criteria for for a lot of different uh, media. They're they're all trying to look at what climate change is going to do, and then when it comes to the the tribes, uh, I think every tribe is going to be unique on how they they choose to interact uh, with that climate data. Um. Another question, sort of looking forward, um, you know, and thinking about the broader application uh, that we just received, might people be able to use this dashboard to help them alter agricultural practices or transition to more resilient income streams as the climate as climate change continues? 
And you know, as I read these questions, if this is a, something that you posed in the Jamboard and you want to speak up and elaborate, please uh, go ahead and do so. Hi, that question was mine, and um, I'm just I'm in the Southwest where, uh, like, a lot of close to here, there's a lot of cotton farming, which uses Colorado River water that ne not necessarily ever going to get replaced. And I was just wondering what the situation in the Great Plains is with regards to that, if the people are going to transition to lower water use crops or things that can survive more extreme temperatures. Yeah, I think there's some innovation going on in the Great Plains, um, given that. And certainly with the Oglala Aquifer, um, it's not been as much of a problem in the Northern Great Plains as the Southern Great Plains, but down in Oklahoma and Texas, um, they've really been pumping a lot of water out and they're seeing the water table drop way too fast. Um, it's not been quite as bad again, further north toward like Nebraska. Um, but I do think that there's some, some innovation going on and, and certainly people are very aware of seeing these changes and, and very much need to be looking at, you know, what they can do. Um, the dashboard itself is, is probably a little more on the um, the short term, you know, in terms of just monitoring what the current, you know, or recent conditions are. And, and as far as outlooks go, you know, it's it, we're looking more like no more than a season, uh, you know, so there's not not really a lot of climate change guidance that you can really glean from that but you know if you're if you're tracking um, these conditions on your own over time and seeing changes then perhaps that information could be used for for you know some kind of uh, application um, mark I don't know if you all um, you know down there are having any talks about agriculture and how that could be changing in a changing climate Oh yeah, definitely. And, and we also realize that, you know, some of the mitigation techniques that we're going to use for drought would be the same mitigation uh, techniques that will help with flood too. So like creating more farm ponds and wetlands is something that is going to build resilience re regardless of uh, which way it goes. And that's the one thing that we're, we're learning is that, you know, it, it's going to be extreme either way. Um, it's either going to be wet or dry, we're not going to have just blue skies constantly. And with drought, it's a little bit difficult because, you know, it, it's a disaster in slow motion. And, you know, it's really tough to, to realize that you're moving towards drought when you're getting a little bit of rain and then you get a ton of rain and realize that that hasn't done anything to recharge the aquifers around here. And so we have had some wells that uh, were either adjacent to tribal property or served tribal uh, members that went dry in the middle of winter. Um, so, and we don't have, it's a, it's a very, it's a perched aquifer, it's a disconnected aquifer and it, it's not getting charged. And so, yeah, that's, it's, it's important for us to begin to understand that even though our rainfall total for the course of the year uh, may stay the same, or even as the NCA, the National Climate Assessment uh, predicted, that it would actually increase a little bit. We're going to see those events happen with more ex more extreme uh, rain events uh, that happen less frequently. So we're going to have more dry days and uh, more really heavy rains. And that that's a condition which is um, not very favorable for aquifer recharge. So we're going to have to make some decisions. And I think individual uh, agriculture producers are, are, are I realize that and, and I think they'll be on board. I mean, uh, soil health is extremely important and they realize that moisture content in the soil is extremely important. And every time they irrigate, they're depleting a resource that's not being replenished. So yeah, there, I, I appreciate your question. And I, I really think that that Colorado River study that I think was actually, uh, you know, kind of accepted into the planning uh, for the, the Colorado River states was, was a remarkable uh, that was one of the things COVID did. It gave me a great chance to listen to some uh, debate on that um, on C-SPAN. Um, so yeah, it, it's a it's interesting how this data can be used to uh, influence agriculture. Yeah, just wanted to pop in one point that I thought of about groundwater. Um, so I mentioned the drought in 2012 and 
Um, compared to other droughts that the plains have experienced, it, it wasn't a particularly long drought in terms of duration. Um, it was basically 2012 to 2013, but 2012 was the really intense year. Um, but there was a groundwater study done in Nebraska, and it, it took at least five or six years for the groundwater table to recover from that drought. So, um, you know, imagine a drought that's longer duration, which certainly the Plains has experienced. The Southwest has been experiencing drought for a really long time. Um, and just thinking about how long, you know, it takes to recover from these events. And if they're starting to happen more often, we may not see full recovery before the next event occurs. And so that really is concerning for, for water supply. I find myself with an ever multiplying list of questions, and I think we could continue this conversation all afternoon. Um, but I just want to take a few moments to wrap up with respect to kale. And um, I invite everyone to keep posting questions to the Jamboard um, because I think we can continue this conversation and, and kale can facilitate this conversation um, with Crystal and Mark. Uh, beyond the session this afternoon. 